Hey, Jay Torres here from Torres and Virtual Security. Today we're going to be covering how I created my very own Hack5 Wi-Fi Tactical Pineapple. Now, you might be wondering what does this thing look like, and I actually have it right here. So, this is my Wi-Fi uh, Tactical Pineapple. Essentially, what this is, is Hack5's product, the uh, Wi-Fi Pineapple, is basically integrated into a hardened, uh, like, rugged case, and what I did is I basically like drilled some holes to put the antennas on the exterior of the case. That way it has better signal coverage. And then it also has some other things inside such as a GPS receiver, like a, a dongle, so that it can essentially war drive. Uh, this thing has four 25 pound magnets on the bottom of it. That way I can just like slap it on top of my vehicle and just, uh, just war drive um, in slow speed areas. Of course, I'm not going to take this on the highway because it's probably a big risk of it just flying off the roof of my car. Um, but yeah, today we're going to be uh, covering how I created this thing, and hopefully uh, you learned something from this video. Now, if this is something that you would like to pursue, like actually um, try and do like a different version of this project, um, I'm going to put uh, the Amazon links on the description below. That way, if you want to actually do this project, which is a very hands-on project, I really liked it. Like me personally, a lot of the projects that I've done for cybersecurity, they've always been uh, virtualized, always on the computer, um, and never actually like drilling holes into something. So I really enjoyed this project, and hopefully if you can partake in it as well, you'll enjoy it as well. So I just wanted to give credit where credit is due, and it was to Glitch from Hack5, because he had released a video about a year and a half ago, um, actually giving step-by-step -step tutorial on how to create your own uh, Wi-Fi pineapple. And it, I was inspired by it and I was like, I want to create my own. Now, uh, his tutorial is not um, very step-by-step -step when it comes to the actual hardware installation. And unfortunately, mine for this video will not be a step-by-step -step, uh, like hardware uh, guide, but I will run you through some of the things that I needed to um, to do to the case to be able to, to actually finish the project. Alrighty, so basically this is uh, this is from my my uh, iPhone. So I'm sorry if the video quality went a little bit down or if I sound differently from here. But this is the exterior view of the tactical pineapple that I created. As you can see, um, this is a Invicta case. Um, so if you haven't heard of like the watch company Invicta. Um, a lot of the watches that you get, they, they come with a rugged case. And I personally was never going to use a rugged case to um, store my watches. I thought that was just a little bit too extreme for watches. So I was like, let me just uh, repurpose this case into something that I'll actually be able to use um, from time to time. Uh, so as you can see, I, I put like a sticker. So says, warning, hacker at work. Not very uh, secretive, right? Um, right here, this is a... I had to drill this hole right here into the case. And essentially this is a USB-C uh, cable that comes into the outside. It's a port, not a cable, I'm sorry. Uh, but you can see it's a uh, water resistant. So it's got this little cap to protect it from water. Um, essentially I plug this USB-C into, into a power brick and it'll charge the battery um, that I have put into this case. That way I don't need to take out the battery, um, take in and out the battery um, every time it needs to be charged. Um, right here we have three holes. Um, there's three RPSMA uh, extenders that I put on the description below. Um, essentially the Wi-Fi pineapple comes with three ports um, for its three different NICs um, so that it can you know channel hop um, in the 2.4 gigahertz frequency. So these three antennas are just connecting to the pineapple and I just drilled the, drilled the hole outside so that it can have obviously better reception. Um, below you can see it has the Invicta logo right there. And I also drilled four holes um, to put these um, four, uh, four 25 pound magnets so that if I wanted to stick this thing on the side of my car, on the top of my car in like a low, um, low speed area, then I could just do that and I would get way better uh, GPS, uh, way, way more accurate GPS coordinates, and of course have uh, better reception, not having all that uh, 
like all, all the frequencies getting messed up because they're inside the car. Outside, you can see it's kind of a mess right now. Um, I don't have great cable management right now because uh, as you can see inside, we have the primary component here, which is Hack 5's uh, Pineapple. Um, I believe this is the Mark 5. I don't remember if it's... I'm sorry, not Mark 5. It's a Mark 7. So that's the latest version that they have so far for the, for the Wi-Fi Pineapple. Um, so you can see, uh, you need to power the Pineapple. So what I use is this Swiss Tech uh, 15,000 milliamp hour uh, power bank. Um, I believe most people have used like either 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 power bank. Um, I believe with this 15,000 power bank, I can get like three to four hours of this operating, which is a long time um, to be just uh, getting all these packets and, um, and handshakes, right? Uh, so yeah, we have the power bank. The power bank is connected uh, the power the power bank's like power port is connected to this outside port. That way, if I want to charge it, then I just do it through the exterior port, and I don't need to take this guy in and out. Uh, then we have a USB Type A port going into the Wi-Fi pineapple right here, and that is what powers on this thing, right? It's what gives it the power, and it's essentially this is what allows me to bring the pineapple anywhere I want without having to have a power, like um, having having it connected to a constant power source. Um, one of the other connectors that we have here is this USB port right here, type A. And this port, uh, this cable goes all the way to this uh, hub that I have. Um, currently I only use the hub for one device and that's the GPS dongle. So that's what I use right now to um, be able to get GPS coordinates and consolidate the data with the GPS coordinates so that we can have the SSIDs of the Wi-Fi access point and also have the GPS data um, to correlate that data with. Um, this thing used to be st like sticked here, but sometimes I just want better reception of it, especially when this thing's inside the car. So I'll just take this guy out and put it next to the window so that it has more accurate uh, coordinates. Um, but overall, it is not too complex. Um, it is definitely challenging for me to drill these holes on this rugged case, especially knowing that if I messed it up, like if I made it too big, then I might potentially need to get another case, right? Um, and I want it to be at least like somewhat watertight so that if it rained, it wouldn't get damaged um, immediately, right? Um, so this is the uh, My Wi-Fi Tactical Pineapple. Um, I have all the components on the description, but let's go upstairs and take a look into the operating system side of this thing and how it actually operates. So now that we have covered the physical aspects of the device, we're just going to dig into more of the uh, operating system side of things. Now, right here on the screen, you'll see that I'm already connected to the Wi-Fi Pineapple uh, via its web uh, management interface. Now, how we do that is, uh, you know how we covered that there's three different antennas for the Wi-Fi Pineapple. Well, actually, one of those is for the interface, the, the management interface, so that we can control the Pineapple um, via Wi-Fi um, when it's on top of the car or somewhere else, right? So right here, we, we have connected to that interface via Wi-Fi to my PC right here at home. And what that allows us is it allows us to connect to the local area network of the device and be able to um, go into the interface via the 1471 port. Um, that is the, the default port that they set for these, for Hack 5's uh, Wi-Fi Pineapple. I believe it can be changed. I haven't really played around with that too much, to be honest. But this is the default IP address and the default um, port to access that management, that web management interface. Uh, so right here, you see we're logging in as root, and I'm just gonna type in my password right here, or that's the wrong one. There we go. So now we're in. Um, 
looks like it's just asking us for different ways we can uh, connect to the Wi-Fi. We can connect the Wi-Fi pineapple to the internet because currently it, it doesn't have any internet access. Uh, right now we're connected to it, but it's via our uh, LAN connection. Um, this is the default, um, um, like I said, management interface for the Wi-Fi pineapple. Now, the way I'm using it to war drive is not really what it was intended to be used for. Uh, the Wi-Fi pineapple is usually intended for um, just simple reconnaissance to look at the SSIDs that are um, around your area and then be able to do something like a rogue access point where you're um, essentially mimicking another access point by copying its channel ID, by um, copying its SSID, and a whole lot of other things to, to basically have clients switch from one client to the other thinking it's the same client, but in reality it's not. And you can do really cool stuff like um, give them internet access, which in their mind they're like, okay, I'm connected to Starbucks's guest network and I'm just accessing uh, Facebook or whatever. But in reality, they're connected to this device and we're able to intercept all that traffic. Now, of course, if that traffic is going through a VPN or if it's encrypted, we're not going to be able to do much with that data. But um, it is just one of the capabilities that the Wi-Fi Pineapple offers. Um, but really, for what we're using it today, um, it'll be for the war driving capability. And it requires a little bit of special configuration to be able to do that. Um, so here we can open a terminal via the... Alrighty, we're back. So uh, we were able to open our web shell here through the terminal icon. And we're just going to make this a little bit bigger so that everyone can see. Um, I'm not sure if I can make this a little bit... Okay, that works. Just so that everyone can see what I'm actually typing in here. Okay, so we're just going to type in ls list directory. Um, and you'll see that this there's this file that's usually not in our home directory, and it's that wardrive.sh. What that is, is a custom built bash script so that, um, and this is something that I was doing in the beginning was I would set my, my uh, tactical Wi-Fi pineapple on the vehicle, and I get in the car, and then I'd have to run like six different commands to get it working. So I was like, well, I know scripting, I know scripting would be the easiest way to solve this issue of having to type six commands every time I want to run this device, right? So let me just um, cat the script, that way we can look into it. Um, it is not a complicated script whatsoever. We're essentially declaring here that it's a bash script and declaring some initial variables here. Uh, this GPS directory variable is just where the device um, resides in for the GPS dongle. The out dir is our output directory. It's where I want the files, um, the word driving files to be outputted into. And then we're overriding the, um, we're doing some override to the mode for Kismet, which is what we're using to consolidate the, the um, network traffic uh, or traffic the uh, wireless traffic um, and also the GPS data and we're just sending that to war drive um, here's more of a, a a fun thing it's just uh, saying launching stone cold killer it's more of like a cyberpunk uh, reference and the reason I did that is because the management uh, the wireless management interface is called Skippy um, which is also a cyberpunk reference so launching someone called Killer, and here we uh, initialize the GPS uh, daemon, um, and we just do dash p as a parameter. And here we're stating, okay, we want you to use this device to be able to input that GPS data. Two, um, and here we're just running the kismet uh, command. We're setting the output path to that variable that we had previously set. And we are choosing these two um, interfaces. 
to get data from, uh, wireless data from. And then we're overriding it uh, because Kismet has a lot of capabilities, um, but really we, we just want that SSID um, data. Um, we don't want anything more than that. And that's what this override to the war drive mode is doing is, is limiting that data because very easily, if I'm going through um, an area with a lot of traffic, a lot of um, SSIDs, this thing could easily crash if I'm trying to take in all, all, all this data at the same time, right? So I have to kind of just funnel that and just kind of pick what I want. And that's what this override mode is doing. Um, so this is an example. We're going to run this script. We're just going to put period slash and then word drive dot sh hit enter. And I'll say it says launching stone cold killer. Um, it runs the GPSD daemon on the background and then you'll see that it'll start, um, um, start kismet on the background here. Um, I'll probably blur a lot of a lot of this information out because this is a real Wi-Fi uh, MAC addresses around the area. But right here, you'll see that this is HTTP localhost 2501. Um, that's really just opening a local port for the Kismet uh, interface. So I'm just going to open that on this other tab real quick. That's what's going to allow us to look at the Kismet um, side of things. Uh, now it looks like we're having an issue here. Let me see. So it looks like um, I was just typing in, I copied this wrong. So uh, since we don't have localhost defined here, um, I just had to replace the localhost for the IP address for the pineapple. And uh, here you can see that I typed in the IP address and then changed the port to the 2501 um, for the Kismet interface. And here you see all the wireless access points that it's found so far. It's found 33. And something that's cool that I use a lot for this is this bottom part of Kismet. And it just shows you historically, right here it's for the past minute. And you can see that um, for every second, how many, how many SSIDs we found per channel um, band. Um, so you see it's color coded and you have each range right here. Um, I use this a lot because sometimes I might run into issues where I'm just not getting any, um, any SSIDs, whether it's a configuration issue on my side or if there's just actually no, um, SSIDs in the area. So again, a lot of this information is going to be blurred out for obvious reasons, but, um, this is what I might be when I'm going through an area while the device is on top of the car or on the back of the car. And I can look at all the, all these devices, right? I can look at the name, which um, in some cases it will be um, a set SSID. If it, there is no SSID set, then it'll just give me the Mac address. Give me the encryption that they're using, specific channel they're on, and uh, the 802.11 standard, of course, for, for wireless. Um, Again, we're just looking for access points. So anything else, it kind of just ignores or drops. Um, yeah, it is really fun looking at other people's SSIDs. Some people get really creative with the the names that they set for the SSIDs. But um, again, all this stuff is being thrown into a into a file, and that file is what we use to upload it into like an open source database like wiggle.net. Um, right here, I don't have the GPS um, device working right. I mean, I don't have it on right now um, because I just did not want to be showing those coordinates for the video. But right here, it would show the GPS data um, coming in from the, from the GPS daemon, right? So um, if we're just going to close this, let's say I'm, I'm done with my engagement and I'm done collecting all these SSIDs. I use control C right here, or I just turn off the device. Um, all right, so there you go. So exiting single service thread complete. And again, we have set, we go to LS again and uh, cat war drive. 
you'll see that we set the output directory for, for all the files, all that data into user slash kismet. So if we just go into that directory and I do ls, here you can see a bunch of different files from previous engagements that I've done to, to get war draft data. Um, and you'll see that it puts it in the wiggle CSP um, format and the kismet format. That's just what that override mode um, sets the default as. Um, but mostly I use this wiggle, dot, um, you know, wiggle CSP format because that is um, one of the acceptable formats for uh, wiggle.net. So let's go into wiggle.net and show you how you upload into the database. Alrighty, so now we're in wiggle.net. Um, it's a very well known um, war driving platform um, just to consolidate all this data that all these war drivers are, are pulling every single day. Um, and it it is really amazing, really. Um, I've used this database a bunch of times for uh, capture the flag events, specifically when they give you a OSINT challenge. And I had never contributed to the database. So when I started this war driving project and I started collecting data, and uploading into the database, it was really cool to to get that um, to get that feeling of of knowing that you're contributing to all this research that people are doing. And, and yeah, so right here uh, you can see the uploads uh, tab right here. Um, if you just click on it, go to upload file, and you just here here you hit browse. I'll ask you for the file that you want to. That you want to upload and use hit send um, it is very straightforward um, you can upload data anonymously right you don't need to have an account to upload the data um, i do just because i like to keep track of like my contribution to the database and it's kind of just like a game right you just at least like so far i've identified like thirty-two thousand uh wi-fi's that had not been discovered before. And I think like 80,000 that had been identified before. So that is one of the things is when I'm going around and trying to war drive, um, sure I'm trying to get as many SSIDs as I can, but I'm also trying to get new ones, right? Um, and that just really have to go in on the map right here and try and figure out, okay, what areas haven't been explored? Um, what 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 areas can I go around to get those new SSIDs and you just kind of get creative with it. Um, but yes, there's millions. I, I want to say, yeah, there's billions of networks that have been uploaded into uh, this database and it will just keep going up over time. Uh, something that was interesting is I think war driving started out as something where people were actually breaking into Wi-Fi's while they were I like looking, like doing recon on, on all these networks. And one of the things is like back in the 2000s, the early 2000s right here in 2002, you can see that 64% of, uh, of Wi-Fi's were not even encrypted. So it was just completely clear traffic, right? You could, see people's credentials. It was, it was kind of crazy, right? Uh, it was a crazy time. I wasn't even a year old around this time, so I can tell you how, how that time was from my perspective. But uh, you can see over time, we have gotten away from having zero encryption. Um, it, it looks like there's still some devices out there that have zero encryption, but for the most part, most of them are encrypted. And eventually we'll start seeing a um like we'll start seeing adoption for wpa3 because right now it doesn't seem like it's a very uh popular encryption um, um encryption method but it, it will get adopted over time as wpa and wpa2 um, are proven that are not um, most safe um, standards to use um yeah, that is it for this video. Again, this was just more of a, a recap of how this device works, how I created it, some of the components that are the, um, that the device uses to be able to function. 
and hopefully you learned something from this video because I really enjoyed this project. I couldn't find a whole lot of videos explaining like specifically how or what components were used in these devices. So if you have any recommendations, if you'd like to see a future video explaining more in depth how I put the hardware together or maybe how I uh, configured the, the application side of this thing, just let me know and I, I would love to keep creating more videos. Right now, uh, this will be my first video from the last one that was almost 10 months ago. Um, but something that I really want to stick by this year is I want to release a new video every single week. So please give me any feedback you have, constructive feedback, so that I can just keep getting, uh, keep improving the content, um, keep helping you guys learn and myself learning because I am learning through this, uh, through this video creation process. So hope you guys have a great day and just. Is, uh, please subscribe because a lot of people that watch these videos, especially specifically cybersecurity, you guys don't subscribe. Subscribe because I will be pumping out videos every single week and hopefully they will be very educational. So, peace.